This uh, upcoming panel will be to feature and highlight state resources and programs that align both in supporting qualified opportunity zone businesses, but then also community and local economic development managers within opportunity zones and promise zones in California. So, you know, not solely two opportunity zones, but we often talk about a lot throughout this webinar and this feature about how a lot of different tools and applications can be used to support businesses and communities. So with that, I'm going to introduce the first panelist that I have to, we have today to give a presentation and that's Shivani with the California Grants Portal. Thank you, Trey. Um, thank you everyone for having me. Um, for some reason, I'm unable to start my video, um, but so. I am here. <laughs> um, and I wanted to introduce uh, all of you to a new resource or tool that's out there for um, folks who are looking for grant opportunities in the state of California. Um, and these grant opportunities are entered by the state agencies who are um, giving out uh, those grant opportunities. So um, I wanted to walk through uh, some of the background information um, and, and go on to showing you actual tool and how it works. Um, next. Thank you. So uh, this uh, tool came uh, out of the legislation, Grants Information Act of 2018. Uh, it is a single single place where all uh, grant opportunities that are in competitive and first come award process nature are added by the state agencies. Um, and it also includes loans and federal assistance funds from those state agencies as well. Um, it does not include any procurement or, or uh, services or anything like that that goes through our um, Department of General Services. So these are grant opportunities um, that are been either given uh, or provided funded funds for uh, to the state agencies to, to give out to uh, organizations. And um, with that, I'm going to move to the next slide and tell you a little bit about how we actually uh, gathered and built this tool a little bit. Um, so we used our user center um, design approach where we actually met with grant seekers and grant makers um, throughout the process of development. So we were given one year to um, implement this tool and it was uh, it went live July 1, 2020. So it's only been a few months since it's been out. So it's brand new. Um, and we gathered a lot of feedback. We may wanted to make sure this is a valuable tool where uh, grant seekers can actually find what they're looking for. Um, we met with nonprofits, we met with lo local government, some small businesses who are utilizing our um, data today to help grant seekers um, in the state. Um, so all of that is, um, all of this data is actually open on data.ca.gov. So if you're interested, uh, you can actually pull it down. You can use an API to pull the information and it is updated every 24 hours. Um, so with that, um, that's how we actually came to where the tool is being utilized and we're continuing to gather feedback along with um, understanding what future needs that our grant seekers and grant makers have um, to continue enhancing our website. So with that, I'm going to actually ask uh, Trey if you wouldn't mind going to grants.ca.gov or I can share my screen myself. Are you able to share, Shivani? Yes. All right, so um, if you go to grants.ca.gov, this is the homepage of the, the portal. Um, like I said, the portal is generated uh, frequently as a grant opportunities become available for um, any of the applicants um, that are looking for those opportunities. So here you can actually fill out a sentence if you're a business um, who is looking for grant opportunities in the state that are competitive in nature, you can select business here. You can go to category. If you have a specific category, you don't have to select a category if you don't know. Oh, I uh, clicked it on before. Um, and then if you know a time frame that you're looking for, you can do that. And that's generated from the data that is in the portal currently. So in this case, I'm actually going to just show you how the business uh, view will look like if you filter that. So I'm going to only look for business um, related grant opportunities. And again, here's the filter. And down here, all of these grant opportunities um, 
are applicant are eligible for uh, businesses. So that's how uh, you can see what is something that you might be interested in. Going back to the homepage, there's other ways you can actually uh, find the same information. You can look through the categories again, a little bit more visual uh, appealing. Um, and then down here, you can again look for by the relevant um, applicant types. So you can select any of the applicant types you're interested in. And then you can also see what was recently posted um, and some statistics down here, um, how many grants were posted in last week, how many do we have currently that are open uh, or forecasted, and then how much do we currently have available in funding uh, through those grant opportunities. Um, if you were interested in looking at everything that this portal has, 130 grant opportunities, you will go to find grants on top. It takes you to this page where it actually shows you different types of filtrations. It has a save uh, current refinements as well. So if you were to just wanna look for a specific filter, you can always save your uh, filter here by clicking on save current filter and it'll tell you what you're saving it as. Currently I have a filter here because I wanted to show you guys um, what grants are available. Um, and then you can uh, come back to it and it will have your filter next time you are here. Um, and so currently I have a filter that is forecasted. So forecasted grants are actually um, grant opportunities that has limited information. They're not open for applications at this moment. Um, they are uh, just giving you a head, uh, head start in some ways to know what's coming. Um, and uh, the information is provided by state agencies and entered by them. So uh, that information, uh, you can at least start looking at any workshops or any public um, you know, uh, meetings that they're holding. So those, that information is available. Uh, not all grants have that, but it's there. Active are those that are actually open for application. Um, and have deadlines or they're ongoing uh, based on the criteria. And then you can select by close as well. So currently, uh, Governor's Office of Business um, Economic Development has these grant opportunities that are active. Um, you can see there's a deadline here. Uh, it has a time or if they're ongoing, you can see that as well. Um, let's say if you're interested in this one, you just wanna know a little bit more. You can see little, little view here with uh, some, in, some of the information, uh, who is the legitimate applicant, like I selected business earlier, or showed you all the business ones, but this one is for public agencies. Um, and then uh, who, if there's any geographic limitations. Um, and if you were interested in looking at the entirety of that grant opportunity, you can click on the title. It will take you to this page and it will give you all the information that you need to know before you can determine if this is something that you can apply for. So for applications, uh, we do not host applications here. So you still have to go to the department's website by clicking on the grant guideline, and that will take you to the actual RFP or um, the document that will walk you through the guidelines uh, before you actually apply for that grant opportunity. And here's oppor uh, opportunity for you to be able to ask questions um, from the department. So if you're, you have any questions about this, you can contact the person listed here. Um, we also have a great uh, feature that you can subscribe for our grant opportunities. You don't want to come every day um, looking for grant opportunities. You can actually subscribe for our daily or weekly notifications of the newest grants or by category. So that is something um, we are highly encouraging folks to uh, subscribe to and it'll help you get what you're looking for um, in your email box. Uh, we do have contact information and uh, feedback that we're always looking for, like I mentioned earlier. So if you go through the site and you have some feedback for us or things that you would like to see in the future on this um, portal, please feel free to fill this feedback form us up and um, send it over to us. And we'll be happy to include um, that to our future uh, co you know, considerations. So with that, I will uh, pass it back to Trey. Thank you for that, Shivani. And I'm going to go ahead and grab screen control again. And then for the next panelist we have up is we have uh, Poonam Patel, who's on our team on GoBiz to discuss different kind of tax incentive programs in CalBiz to support businesses. 
Great, thank you, Trey. Can you hear me okay? You're good. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you all for joining. I know we're, we're the last set of panelists today, so I hope you're still awake and with us. Um, my name is Poonam Patel, as Trey mentioned. I'm the Assistant Deputy Director for the Business Investment Services team here at GoBiz. Uh, Trey, can you go to the next slide, please? I know Trey gave a great introduction about who GoBiz is and what we do at the um, at the beginning of this event. Um, just to summarize that real quick for you, for those who have just chimed in, we provide um, a, a service to a number of different businesses in government, as well as local, state, and federal partners in economic development. Um, we are oftentimes seen as the single point of contact for economic development and job creation efforts here in the state. And we offer services to business owners communities and uh, site selectors. Uh, the unit that I specifically work for is the California Business Investment Services team and we specifically help out with tailored uh, site selection for companies. So companies looking for a site here in California, we will actually work with them uh, to uh, help them find a site here in California. And we work collectively with our local regional economic development partners across the state to actually do that. And then we also provide incentive navigation for businesses. So oftentimes, um, as it relates to site selection or just in general for resources that companies are looking for um, to get connected with, our team has a number of different specialists that can walk companies through the array of resources and programs um, that can be availed to them to be, help them be successful here in California. Uh, as part of larger GoBiz, we also have some other programs and services to help with job creation and economic development efforts in the state. Um, namely, we have a permitting assistance team to assist with uh, uh, direct uh, advice on permits, licenses, certifications, anything that you would really need to get up and running here in the state of California and stay in compliance. We also have an international affairs and trade team who you're going to be hearing from my colleague, a part of that um, after um, I present. Um, and then we also have got a small business advocate team to really help out with a lot of the different um, capital access barriers that small businesses here in the state of California incur and other aspects of getting um, direct assistance for small business and technical assistance with our small business development centers. I'm actually gonna be covering today um, our tax incentive programs that we have here at the state of California that can help um, and bridge gaps to getting projects um, up and running in opportunity zones and other uh, tax-based um, incentive programs that are more place-based in, in, in theory. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, please, Trey. So before I begin, I just wanted to point you to our website, business.ca.gov, uh, where we house a lot of this information, whether it's tax credit information, sales and use tax information, um, other incentive programs um, that you're gonna hear about today that can be helpful for businesses. We also have a business portal where we organize incentives by industry type, um, by their operations and activities. So whether companies are gonna be hiring workers, needing to train them, which you're also gonna hear about later on today from our uh, employment training panel. Um, and then we also have uh, incentives that are listed out by financing opportunities. So businesses that may be interested in tax exempt bond programs or loan assistance programs. So before I start on the tax incentive side, I just wanted to briefly mention that, you know, our team is really focused on helping companies handhold them through the process of applying for these different programs. And so really, um, you know, our strength is to connect directly with companies to help navigate them through the, the array of resources resources based on their operations and activities. Next slide, please. So we'll go ahead and start with the California Competes Tax Credit Program. This program actually lives within the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development, and it's a non-refundable tax credit. It has a six-year tax carryover. The way to look about uh, the way to look at this program is really to see it as a perspective going forward for the next five years. So companies are actually submitting to us how many corporate income tax credits they feel they need to have a project work out in California 
or to have their company locate in California and be successful. So they're telling us how many jobs they're going to be creating, what capital investments they're going to be making over that five-year period, along with what they're requesting in terms of a credit amount. This application is competitive. We have three application rounds um, that we um, process within the fiscal year in California. And by fiscal year, we mean July 1st to June 30th. Um, and so it's quite timely that we're introducing this program because our next round is going to be on January 4th of 2021, and it will end on January 25th. We have 80 million to give out in corporate income tax credits um, in that application period, but we're also going to have another round, our last uh, round for this fiscal year on March 8th as well. Our CalCompetes team um, is, is up, is ready and available for anyone to contact them, but our, our team on the CalBiz side can also help answer questions about this program, but they have some helpful webinars that are uh, scheduled in January that will walk companies through the actual application process to apply for this program. They'll actually go through a live and tangible example um, to help companies get an understanding of how to apply and what different uh, levels of data they're going to need to um, plug into the application. You can really think of this as um, submitting essentially what your five-year business plan would be um, in terms of a job creation and capital investment standpoint. There are um, criterias that make you uh, competitive. This is again a Cal Competes um, program. Um, so when you're thinking about applying for this, the case that you're trying to make here is, but for this um, incentive program, your project may not work out in California. And so that's really what you're trying to prove in your application to be competitive. Next slide, please. The other corporate income tax credit program that we have is the research and development income tax credit program. Um, this is actually quite similar to a federal research and development um, income tax credit program. The state really just piggybacks off of that. And it's available to taxpayers that are in involved in uh, research activities in California. Um, so if you are, are doing research and development in California, and we've listed out some qualifying research expenses here on the slide for you, um, and you are uh, either doing that internally, you're incurring those expenses on your own, or you are even contracting out to a third party entity to help you do your research and development and incurring expenditures there. Um, you, could, you may be eligible for a R&D tax income credit to help with those uh, incurred costs that you have. Um, so this is, a pro this is uh, not a program that you necessarily have to apply for. This is um, something that is claimed on your tax returns when you file them with our California State Franchise Tax Board. Next slide. So the other corporate income tax credit program that we have is the new employment credit. This is a, a program that's also administered by the Franchise Tax Board here in California. It's meant to, hire, to incentivize employers to hire specific types of employees in what we call designated geographical areas. And those areas are typically high unemployment and high poverty areas that oftentimes align, um, and quite frankly, most of these designated geographical areas are also probably part of the opportunity zones too. So there's some cross layering there of incentives that can be packaged in total um, for a project to happen. So the way that this program works is employers that are high, hiring specific types of employees. So we're talking about former veterans, um, those uh, who have been uh, formerly incarcerated. It could be um, you know, people who have been unemployed for longer than six months. And quite frankly, in the uh, you know, era that we are in right now, that supply of work force is quite large. Um, so if you're hiring these types of uh, workers and you're hiring those workers in, in these designated geographical areas, um, you would be eligible to receive a corporate income tax credit that's based upon the wages that you pay these employees. You have to be paying these employees above minimum wage, um, and the wages uh, must be it must exceed 150% of the minimum wage. Um, so this is definitely a program that if you are uh, know that you're hiring this type of demographic um, and you're planning on making hires in the next year or coming years, um, you definitely want to take a look at this program to see if you would be eligible for the new employment credit to receive that credit um, 
for each employee of this demographic that you are hiring. Um, and so, you know, we want to make sure that if you are in an opportunity zone and you are a business and you would be making these hires that you could also utilize this program as well. Next slide. So the other program that we have is a partial sales and use tax exemption. This is specific um, to manufacturers, but there is also a um, another sales and use tax exemption program for agricultural operations as well. Um, so the, the eligibility for this program is based on your NAICS code, your industry classification code. Um, and so if you fall within the uh, NAICS code, which is a three series code, which is a general manufacturing um, designation, you would be eligible to receive a partial sales and use tax exemption um, at, at that, uh, the rate that's listed on the slide there, 3.9% for any equipment purchases that you make. Um, and the way that this program is structured is, is it's not something that you have to apply for. It's like uh, filling out a one-page form that you provide to your uh, vendor, similar to like a resale certificate to be exempted at the point of time for this, uh, for purchasing the equipment on the sales and use tax, which is just the state portion. Um, the agricultural sales and use tax exemption um, is actually a little bit higher. It's at 5%, and that's for any equipment purchases you would be making for farm equipment and machinery um, equipment purchases. And again, similar to the general manufacturing sales and use tax exemption, there is an, an application. Um, you would fill out a one-page form to provide that to whoever you're purchasing the equipment to be exempted at the, point of, at the, at the time of point of sale. Um, this exemption program can also qualify for research and development equipment um, that you may be purchasing as well. Um, and so, you know, we'd want to make sure that you would be eligible, what the equipment purchases that you're planning to make, if you're a manufacturer, that you'd be eligible for that. And this department actually has a really handy get it in writing program. So you can actually write to the Department of Tax and Fee Administration, um, listing out what equipment purchases you plan to make. And the department will actually respond back to you in writing um, what, whether these equipment purchases that you plan to make would qualify. So very helpful program. And oftentimes I know companies, um, you know, want it in writing that they are going to be able to utilize this credit for different purchases that they make. Next slide, please. So this next program that we have is a new program that just got announced um, by our governor um, and it's called the uh, Small Business Hiring Credit. It is actually a credit that can go against um, your uh, sales and use tax or income tax here in California. It was mainly set up to help with um, you know, the COVID-19 uh, impacts that a lot of our businesses are facing. And really um, how, how it is structured is, um, you know, this, it was came out of uh, Senate Bill 1447. And on September 9th, uh, the governor signed this bill into effect. And so it provides financial relief to qualified small businesses um, that have incurred economic disruptions in uh, due to COVID-19. And so how it's structured is starting on December 1st, actually the Department of Tax and Fee Administration started allowing uh, tentative credit reservations for application for businesses to apply for. Um, and that um, qualification for those businesses is, is you have to have 100 or fewer employees as of December 31st, 2019. And you have to have experienced a 50% decrease in gross receipts from April to June 2020. That's comparative against gross receipts in the previous year from April to June 2019. So they're already starting to apply or accept um, tentative credit reservations. Um, and that is going to last through January 15. So we really encourage um, those businesses that would meet this eligibility criteria to try and apply as soon as they can. It's on a first come for serve basis um, until uh, the funds are depleted. Uh, and the credit is equal to $1,000 uh, for each um, net increase in um, an average number of employees that a, a business will hire. Uh, and the max for that that can be achieved is 100000 so we want to make sure that any businesses that would be eligible for this um, has the opportunity to apply for that tentative credit reservation with the Department of Tax and Fee Administration. Next slide. 
So that concludes the summary of the tax incentive portion of this presentation. Um, like I mentioned earlier, you know, we have a lot of programs uh, and resources that we work with at the state level um, and, and also with our local partners. The best thing to do is really get in touch with us so we can understand what your situation is as a business um, and also get you connected to the right state partners that we have to walk you through different programs that we have at the state level that can help you be successful. So thank you for this opportunity and thank you for chiming in and I will pass it over to Trey. Great, thank you, Poonam. With that, we have our next presenter. So we have Robert Meyer with the Employment Training Panel. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, there's Poonam's picture again on the screen. <laughs> there we go, there's my content. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be able to speak to everybody today and I do realize it is towards the end of the day as Poonam had mentioned. Um, so I'm with the Employment Training Panel. I'm the Director of Economic Development, largely uh, overseeing the uh, development and implementation of a business engagement strategy with our program and uh, aligned incentives. Uh, the Employment Training Panel itself is a state agency. We're a part of the Labor and Workforce Development Agency. Uh, uh, we administer a fund that uh, uses a pay per performance contract structure to reimburse employer uh, customized job skill training. That's literally all we do. Um, we have about $80 million this year. Uh, that's a lot, but uh, it's actually down from our typical uh, uh, fund of 100. Uh, million. Uh, these funds are aggregated from employer uh, uh, reported wages. Um, we have 29 million as of uh, later this week uh, available for the remainder of the fiscal year. So we are spending it. Um, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, given the economic circumstances, we have a demand of well over 103 million. Um, it's actually much higher than that. Um, we are uh, going to be forced to narrow our funding focus, uh, but we will have funds every year. Um, so we anticipate in uh, June, we will have more funds to spend uh, for the coming year. So next slide. There we go. So uh, our primary contracting effort is with uh, single employers. Uh, this will be uh, private for profit. Uh, in California, if you are uh, reporting wages for your employees, uh, most likely you are eligible. Uh, certain tax rated nonprofit, it's late in the afternoon, so I will not talk about unemployment insurance. Um, you can reach out to our team if you want to know if your company is eligible and for what programs. Um, we also work with chambers of commerce, trade associations, economic development corporations, uh, as well as uh, community colleges, training agencies, and uh, local and regional workforce development boards. Uh, some specialty programs that administer WIOA. Um, those other groups uh, besides the employers um, really focus on aggregating the needs of multiple employers in a region or by an industry sector. Uh, and we directly contract with them to uh, help them address the training needs of the employers with, uh, which they serve. You'll see a contact term there, multiple employer contractor. That just means those types of contracts. So um, next slide. Um, who we train, basically new and existing full-time workers. That's a bulk of what we do. Uh, we also do a large number of apprenticeship and journey worker trainees, as well as small business owners. And there's uh, typically 10 or fewer full-time employees. Um, we do specialty programs uh, for training uh, new workers. So these are unemployed individuals that get trained and placed into full-time employment. Um, what we fund in terms of the training is just the customized job skills training. Uh, uh, anything that is free, is legally mandated, is not specific to a job, typically we wouldn't include an ETP contract, but it is largely driven by the employer. So we would discuss what their uh, training needs really are and what the best format for that training would be. We offer a range of uh, in-person classroom training as well as uh, distance learning, obviously given, you know, the COVID. Um, and then the, the real flexibility here is that employers can select any training provider to deliver the training. This includes internal staff that know the production floor, know the processes, know the proprietary technologies um, to community colleges and other third-party provider equipment manufacturers, for example. Um, 
every contract that we fund requires a post-training retention period. So as soon as training is finished, they're working uh, full-time during a retention period and they earn a contract specific minimum wage. Um, it is, uh, you know, hovers between uh, 17 and $19 an hour uh, for most employers. Uh, some will have higher requirements and in areas that are high economic uh, impact or economically disadvantaged, they will have a lower wage threshold permissive. Um, there is an in-kind contribution and that's largely the investment that the employer is making by paying the workers during training. Um, it can also cover equipment, uh, facility rentals and other costs. It's not cash on hand. It's typically seen as a partnership between employers, uh, the contractor and ETP. Uh, and so that is a representative level of their investment in, in the program. Next slide. Uh, this current year, uh, obviously, we're focused on job creation and high economic impact. Uh, we have critical proposals. We support uh, cascade and cadence, largely advanced manufacturing uh, and cybersecurity focused programs for the defense supply chain. So if you're working with defense contractors or PTAC networks, SBDCs, this is a program that they might be interested in. Um, we are working with zero emission vehicle technology, both a direct partnership with the CEC, but also with GoBiz uh, and Tyson Eckerley's group. Um, and we also look at underserved workforce populations. This would be veterans. This would be uh, high unemployment areas, uh, at-risk youth, offenders, re-entry workers, uh, really looking at it. Also individuals with disabilities. So um, that's a, a big part of, of our main effort right now. We have a response plan and a pilot program for COVID. Um, the response plan is largely new and existing workers really in the industry sectors that are critical. They've been deemed by the governor to be critical to the uh, reopening of the economy. Um, the response pilot is even more focused, uh, covers really healthcare, agriculture, and the food supply chain manufacturing uh, uh, related industry sectors. But that one, the pilot, is really uh, a, an infusion program to stimulate job creation. So there's no existing workers under that pilot. Um, we have a respond program to help deal with impacts to natural disaster, including earthquake and fire, as well as the COVID pandemic. Um, and then our main effort has always been around the priority industries of manufacturing, engineering, construction, biotech, uh, IT, and clean technology. There are others, but those seem to be the biggest thrust. Um, and then lastly, we have a new grant program for any small business that has been impacted by the expansion of paid family leave. We are providing a direct $500 payment uh, for these small businesses. So if they have an impact and an, a worker goes out on paid family leave or requests an extension of the unpaid family leave and they have 10 or fewer full-time employees, we are facilitating a $500 payment. Now, all of these initiatives, we will uh, go over in more detail um, at an interactive orientation, uh, which we provide monthly. Next slide. Uh, this is it. So, you know, we obviously have a big demand for funds. So that's kind of forcing the more competitive projects uh, to the forefront. Uh, so we are looking carefully at wage levels, uh, secure jobs, at low turnover, uh, the economic investment that's also being pulled from other incentives. Uh, so really to maximize not only the impact of BTP's funding, uh, but the involvement and utilization of local and regional economic development incentive programs, as well as the workforce program. So we're really at that intersection. And so these are, you know, it's a real opportunity for our panel to weigh in, to see, to understand the impacts uh, that our funds are actually having. Um, we have a list of multiple employer contract partners. These are active contracts where if you have a referral or you have an employer that's interested in training and needs it now, we can find a partner for them and just have them sign up. They can then benefit from the training without the administrative uh, um, accoutrement of, of really writing their own contract. This is an easy way for them to participate while they are either interested, getting more information, uh, or ultimately looking to develop their own ETP contract. Um, we have an interactive orientation next week. There is a link there. Um, if you want to uh, just 
sign up on that. It's on our website as well. Just search for interactive orientation under the get started menu. Um, and we provide technical assistance for the from beginning to end uh, counseling, you know, uh, referral support, technical assistance in, in the contracting process and troubleshooting. So if there's something about it, how to approach, if you have a referral, you're not sure, we can help mask, maximize that. Also, we find that if we're not the right program, we can try and, and get you connected to, to to uh, the resources that I think would be, you know, most relevant or important for you um, and follow up and not just leave you sort of there. We do pick up the phone. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. Not that one. There we go. Yeah. See, contact us. We're nice people. This is my team, uh, Renee Pierce in Northern California and uh, Elsa Wadzinski in Southern California. Both of them have tremendous uh, experience and resources, and, and I'm very, very proud of to be able to work with them. Uh, they will follow through, they will follow up on, on detail or inquiries, and it really starts with a what if. So that's what we do, uh, you know, it, relative to the, the, the panel. Uh, we're a small department. Uh, we like to think we have a, a big impact and uh, look forward to working with you. Um, if you have inquiries, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and if you'd like more information on the program, that interactive orientation is a good overview. Um, and uh, that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Robert. And so we will have our next panelist, which will be Maria Honorado with our International Affairs and Trade Team. And for anyone else just who is submitting questions, you can submit questions at any time. We're recording them for saving for Q&A at the end. And you can do that in the chat or the Q&A. Maria? Hi, thanks so much, Trey. Uh, my name is Maria Honorado. I'm the Foreign Direct Investment Specialist at the California Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development, or GOBiz. Uh, as Trey and Poonam noted, we're the state of California's single point of contact for job growth, economic development, and business assistance efforts. Uh, I'm going to give an overview of California's international work pretty broadly, then talk about foreign investment in our state, and then I want to take a closer look at an incentive that I think is really important. Uh, and that's foreign trade zones. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, both Poonam and Trey gave a great overview of our office. I'll just run through this quickly. Uh, we have five teams at GoBiz that serve California businesses and communities. I'm on the business development and international team. So we help businesses grow and support international trade and investment attraction globally. GOBIS also administers tax credits, uh, gives grants to community organizations, promotes zero emission vehicle market development, and of course supports California small businesses. Uh, next slide, please. As the fifth largest economy in the world and a global leader for cutting edge innovation, higher education, climate science, trade logistics, and more, international engagement is really important across California's government. Uh, this is why in February 2019, Governor Newsom signed an executive order giving Lieutenant Governor Eleni Kunalakis oversight of California's international interests. As a former U.S. ambassador to Hungary under the Obama administration, the Lieutenant Governor really understands the importance of maintaining and promoting California's international relationships. Uh, in addition to developing and enhancing our ties with global partners, the international team at GOBIS is responsible for promoting California's exports and attracting foreign investment to our state. Uh, I'm really going to focus on the foreign investment side, but before I dive into that, I wanted to share a brief overview of our export work. On the export side, we administer the California State Trade Expansion Program, commonly referred to as STEP. This is a program that helps small businesses increase their exports. Through the program, we organize and facilitate commercially focused trade missions, California representation at international trade shows, and other export promotion activities. In addition, STEP also provides reimbursement grants directly to California small businesses to support individual export development activities. Uh, next slide, please. Diving into foreign investment, uh, California is really a leader nationwide for foreign investment attraction. We're the number one US state for jobs supported by foreign investment at about 730,000. In 2019, California received investment from more than 100 unique source countries and more than 18,000 individual uh, business, foreign owned businesses are, are in our state. 3.9% of total employment in California is attributable to foreign owned businesses. Uh, foreign investment impacts communities across the state from metropolitan hubs to more rural communities in the Central Valley, Northern California uh, and everywhere else. The top sector for that investment is manufacturing which is followed by information, trade and financial activities. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, I'd like to dive into manufacturing because I think it's really important for the state. Uh, we've been at the center for manufacturing output in the U.S. for decades with over 35,000 manufacturing firms employing over 1.3 million Californians. Uh, our firms have created new industries, supplied the world with manufactured goods uh, in a variety of critical sectors, aerospace, electronics, zero emission vehicles. Uh, on the foreign investment side, we look at manufacturing in three general buckets. Uh, which are much broader than their names imply. Food and clothing, metals and minerals. Food and clothing includes food processing, preserving, drying, uh, textiles, knits, apparel, leather, footwear, and more. Minerals includes all wood products, all paper products, uh, petroleum, coal, pharmaceuticals, uh, plastics, glass, cement, concrete, and more. Um, metals uh, is probably uh, you know, the more uh, commonly thought of manufacturing sector. Um, it includes uh, all hardware, electronics, HVAC, engines, iron, steel, uh, and much more. Next slide, please. Ne next slide, thank you. Um, about a third of all the jobs supported by foreign investment in California are in manufacturing specifically, and 60% of those are in metals, as you can see here, followed by minerals, and then lastly, food and clothing. Our top source for that foreign investment is uh, Japan followed by Switzerland, France, and the UK. Though, as you can see here, we get really uh, valuable uh, foreign investment from many, uh, many other countries as well. Uh, next slide, please. So, so why are international companies like the manufacturers we've just discussed drawn to California? This state is home to more startups, engineers, scientists, researchers, Nobel laureates than anywhere else in the nation. Uh, the 2020 Nobel Prize winners were recently announced and Californians won in physics and medicine. Our entrepreneurs received more than $67 billion in venture capital funding last year, which is more than three times the second highest state for deal flow. Uh, California's success in these sectors is no accident. Um, we have globally renowned research universities in our universities of California. Our Cal State universities and community colleges have advanced technology workforce uh, development programs across the state in urban and rural areas. So I hope this makes it clear why so many companies continue to choose our state as the one they're gonna launch and grow in. Uh, furthermore, economic research shows that technological innovation is accelerated during recession. So states that already have a strong foundation in R&D, such as California, may be best suited to, uh, to adapt to a post COVID-19 world. Uh, it's our first priority to do everything we can to provide for the health, safety, and well-being of all Californians. And as we move forward, this really means um, ensuring economic recovery that improves public health, addresses inequality, and stays committed to California values. We welcome international investment to further these goals. We understand that starting a business overseas is a complex process, so we put together a checklist to help navigate the first steps to getting started in our state. This includes information on how to register with the California Secretary of State, how to open a U.S. bank account, first permitting steps to be aware of, and more. We'll hold your hand through the entire process of investing in California. Uh, our services include permitting support. We can help navigate permitting requirements specific to each business, which are determined by the industry and the location. We also offer a free and confidential site selection service. Businesses can identify their unique requirements and we'll help them find the right location to fit their needs. We can also connect them directly with our local partners to, to help navigate at the local level as well. Uh, we can also walk businesses through the incentives that they may be eligible for, uh, which Poonam uh, gave a wonderful overview of. These include tax credits, workforce training dollars, utility incentives, and more. Uh, next slide, please. I touched on manufacturing earlier as a key sector for foreign investment. Um, there are nearly 3,000 foreign-owned businesses in the manufacturing sector, supporting nearly 250,000 jobs. Given the importance of the sector to California's economy and to foreign investors in our state, I wanted to touch on an incentive that is particularly interesting to manufacturers with global ties, uh, foreign trade zones or FTZs. Like opportunity zones, foreign trade zones are a federally administered place-based incentive. Foreign trade zones are geographic areas where goods can be held or manufactured and are not subject to customs duty until they leave the zone, which is when they technically enter US customs territory. There are 18 foreign trade zones in California, making us the number three state in the US based on the number of FTZs. California FTZs support more than 40,000 jobs and $4 billion in exports. 
there are several important benefits to businesses that might be interested in foreign trade zones. Uh, firstly, duty deferral. Customs duties are deferred on imports until they leave the zone, which, uh, like I mentioned previously, is when they technically enter U.S. Customs territory. Furthermore, items can be transferred between different zones without any duty payments needing to be made. Uh, duty exemptions. No duties or quota charges are made on re-exports because items that enter and then leave the zone directly do not actually enter U.S. Customs territory. Inverted tariff. This is for businesses that import inputs to their manufactured products. They'd only be paying tariffs on the final product, not the input, which can result in savings. Streamlined logistics. Imports can be delivered directly into the zone. Uh, these are waived on scrap and waste. This is really important for manufacturers that might make uh, delicate <laughs> products that are likely to break. Duties aren't paid on any goods that are destroyed in the zone because they've never entered U.S. Customs territory. Lastly, importing goods can be held in indefinitely. There's no required uh, time limit to the amount of time in the zone. Uh, next slide, please. Given the benefits to businesses, you might be wondering how your company or your community can start uh, taking advantage of this incentive. This is a map of California listing all of the foreign trade zones or foreign trade zone grantees in our state. A grantee is the city, county, or port that's been designated as a foreign trade zone. If, you, if you're a business that's located in or near one of these grantees, you can find contact information for each grantee online. And I have a link for that on the next slide. Um, can we go to the next slide? Thanks. So for foreign trade zones are federally administered, but they're managed at the local level. So individual FTZs locally will be able to walk you through, through their unique process and fees. If you're a community that's wondering if your city or county would benefit from having an FTZ, there are resources for you as well. Communities interested in applying to become grantees must submit a, a simple application will receive a response in just about 30 days and you can find a link there. A new grantee can apply under the alternative site framework, which defines the zone's service area. Grantees designate a service area, which can be up to 60 miles or 90 minutes driving time from their border. You just have to be close enough to US Customs and Border Protection Office for them to uh, serve your location. Multiple grantees can designate a geographic region as part of their service area, so there can be overlap among grantees. Next slide, please. In closing, I just wanna say uh, I'm here to help. If you're an international business that's interested in California, please contact me anytime. I'm happy to talk about uh, navigating state government incentives and the steps to launch in California. I also work with communities across the state that are interested in expanding their foreign investment attraction strategies. So to all the communities on this call, I would be more than happy to connect with you to discuss foreign investment data for your region and strategies to bring more international business into your community. Uh, and of course, if anyone has any questions about foreign trade zones, I would be more than happy to connect anytime soon. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. And with that, we will finish out the last portion of the presentation before we open it up with all those who are uh, on this panel to do Q&A from the audience. So I will be covering the last portion and trust me, I did put this the last because you probably are looking at the words tax increment financing right now and you're looking at the time of 419 and you're wondering why, where you are, why you're listening to tax increment financing. But I think that this tool is very power, paramount in considering what we're doing in economic recovery and a lot of these values that we are thinking about in moving forward uh, in pairing place-based tools and incentives. So I will go through this really quickly, uh, but I want to actually just start and say that there is more content on tax increment financing tools to come. So just again, to go over GoBiz really quickly, uh, same slide as earlier, but the middle piece being kind of that local economic development services that is under GoBiz to be able to talk about these different tools that exist in a place-based nature to support and build out kind of the larger economic development picture for a community city in California. So what is tax increment financing? So for those who are not familiar with redevelopment on the line, uh, the tax increment financing works by, you know, you are taking forecasted projected property tax values based on a base year in the future to be able to do economic development in the interim. 
And if you are familiar with redevelopment agencies in California, redevelopment agencies were agencies and institutions that utilized tax increment financing to do much of the re economic development activity that they were doing within communities in California. There are a multitude of reasons as to why you know, redevelopment does not exist, but since the dissolution of redevelopment, a suite of tools has been made available to economic development uh, leaders across California to be able to utilize to still capture this tool and mechanism to do economic development. And it's not only important just to economic development managers, communities, and cities and counties. It is very instrumental to businesses, to different types of public works projects, you know, sponsored by philanthropy or sponsored by nonprofits. These tools are very nimble in the application of what they can be used for. And I'll be discussing that a little bit more in detail. But, you know, the last point, as I would just say, is that you are, you have, these tools have the ability once they're in place as an authority or a body to be able to leverage other funding resources and capital out there on a public nature to be able to do economic development. And I think a lot of economic development managers and thinking about losing redevelopment or thinking about where they stand here is they often talk about, you know, it would be really, you know, they're working in a local government setting if they had a separate body within the local government that is nimble enough to be able to access loans, grants, bonds at the treasurer's office, bonds at iBank, these types of things. So the benefit being, of course, the tax increment financing, but then also that you're creating this authority and body to be able to leverage other funding and resources. So to talk about this in opportunity zones and why it is good to opportunity zones, and I put an image over here of the first EIFD of significant, you know, from a very small community. There's no opportunity zones tie-in, but I think one of the first things I often hear about when I talk about tax increment financing with small, smaller and rural and communities and counties saying, look, none of these tools are an option for me. There are plenty of small cities around the state who are both embarking on the process of creating tax increment financing districts and also exploring different options for funding the planning of them, uh, which I'll also talk about later. So there's a lot of verb you know, language right here in the forefront. And the thing is to point out that there's been a lot of these tools created since the dissolution of redevelopment. The two most, most notable ones are the Enhanced Infrastructure Financing District, which you probably heard a lot of panelists mention throughout the day. There's one in Fresno. Uh, we had heard that there's one ongoing considering for the Salton Sea in Riverside. Um, Someone mentioned that the city of Riverside had undergone a process to create another, a CREO, which is another tool, but the EIFD being the most notable and the most widespread, and I'll talk about why that is in a moment. Uh, the other one is the Community Revitalization and Investment Authority, and as it was shared, Riverside is the only city that, you know, our knowledge within GOBIS that is embarked in the process of exploring of utilizing this tool. And what can this be used for? Uh, affordable, the CREA, I mean, I put some of the examples in here, but I'll dive into which one can be used for which. But affordable housing, giving grants to small businesses, loans to small businesses, going to bond. Um, you can bring in new market tax credit money in one of the tools. So it's, it's really nimble infrastructure, public works, sewage, transit stations, high-speed rail stations. It's really a wide array of use cases. And so why are these tools great for pairing with opportunity zones? Um, and it's the nature of what opportunity zones are and just from a basic level, and then what these place-based tax increment financing tool, tools are, these districts that you create over an area. One is public and one is private, right? You are having public capital from basically a base year on property tax that you're using in a future to be able to bring money to the forefront to do economic development opportunity zones with private capital into a project, for example, to be able to develop something. So, and a perfect example case scenario is you have opportunity zones for a project for affordable housing with federal consideration for funding for potential resources for affordable housing in a project in a parcel, and you have a tax increment financing tool to provide the infrastructure for the project. Um, instead of having to maybe put the onus on the developer or some other outlet or some type of grant or funding that you have to pursue in the process. 
So this is why they match well. The other reason is they are a great piece to attract additional opportunity zones investment. And um, you know, they are geographically less restrictive, at least the EIFD is. So for example, you can have, you have a project in opportunity zones, which theoretically could end, you know, there's project development has a shorter timeline. You have the 10 year exit, you know, you can have tax increment financing come along to further out the development over the lifetime of the project. So think about it, a tax increment financing tool, like a redevelopment agency once was, it's a static entity that is there over a long period of time in economic development. And so I'm just going to talk about these two specific ones. I actually want to go back to this one and just explain all these acronyms here. There's Affordable Housing Authority, there's Seaport Infrastructure Financing District, Infrastructure Financing District, Neighborhood Infill Financing Transit Improvement District, which is NIFTY, and there's also NIFTY 2. There's IFRDs, which actually are for military use, so Infrastructure Financing Revitalization District, Workforce house, Housing Opportunity Zones, um, you know, HSDs, which are his Housing Sustainable District, Sustainability Districts, and annex, Annexation Development Plans. Uh, the one I actually want to highlight is that last one, which is for unincorporated disadvantaged communities. It really stands apart from the rest and that you're able to use in that area. Point being is there is a lot of these tools. So uh, following the event, if there's any of them that you think you know, this is where the tailored consultation comes in with GOBIS. You're asking, giving a perspective of who you are and where you're going with your project or community, and maybe us coming in to think about what is one of the best tools for you to pursue and why. Uh, so CREA and EIFD are the two I'm gonna focus on most importantly today. And I've highlighted, I think, two of the most notable differences between the CREA and the EIFD. CREA, they both confront infrastructure, public works, community projects, transit, port development, uh, everything that you can think of at the nexus of economic development. Um, but the EIFD is really governed by financing infrastructure law. So it's supposed to be doing public works projects, sewage. Uh, it can do brownfield remediation. The CREA is different. It acts as an independent authority and agency like redevelopment did, like a redevelopment agency and it is able to provide funding through its tax increment to affordable housing project. It can provide rental assistance and loans to tenants and owners. It can give funding to owners, business owners who have, you know, if you have a business owner who purchased an older building in your downtown, a CREA can provide the funding to that business owner to revitalize, revitalize that specific structure. So think just like redevelopment in that can, in, in the same sense. There are some you know, rules with respect to this law in terms of like you have, has to align with a planning document. Uh, so it's not just the same as redevelopment, but you are able to do those things with it and you can provide grants and loans to businesses and so on and so forth. So EIFD and CREA, CREA has an affordable housing element. You can do affordable housing economic development with it. You can do assistance, business, assistance to businesses. And then the CREA and the EIFD, the one thing I wanna say is the CREA is a very specified census tracts based on income, employment, crime, count viral screen, which is a metric. It has a requirement of 25% of all the use of the increment is for affordable housing. That is not the traditional definition of affordable housing in that you have to use it all particularly for units. There's use in the law for it to be used for other things. A rental assistance, and you can also pop, partner with a nonprofit to be able to administer that work as a local government. It does have acquisition by eminent domain, but there's a lot of different rules and guardrails comparatively to the past with redevelopment, and it acts independently under redevelopment law and not under infrastructure law as the EIFD does. The CREA as a separate authority can leverage new market tax credit dollars, federal grant funding, HCD funding as a body to take, it can take in the money to then be able to push forth that funding to a project. You could take EDA funding into your CREA and then use it to push and flow through to a project that you are wanting to align with the goals that you create in a plan. The EIFD can also do many of the same things. It cannot do that last piece of passing through the funding to do a project. It has to, you can have federal funding or in a capital stack with an EIFD but it is governed by a different form of law. And it's very popular for the reason that is at the top, which is they, there's no 
um, restrictions on where you place the tool. So you can, you can place it in a census tract that you feel is the most applicable given where you can see property tax growth over time in your community. <clears throat> it, can, it cannot do the business assistance piece, <clears throat> but you could, you could do infrastructure development to support an incubator or small business development center or around the project. <clears throat> um, it does not have an eminent domain authority. So these are just uh, just two really quick images of how communities are looking at these tools. One of them being EIFD, City of El Cajon, looking at an EIFD uh, down around the area where their opportunity zones are, and City of Riverside, who embarked on a public process for a community revitalization investment authority um, <clears throat> previously during before COVID uh, to be able to create this tool uh, with opportunity zones. And so, you know, they really match well uh, together. The CREA and the OZ probably even more so because of the income and, and metric related to, uh, you know, disadvantaged communities and census tracts. So I, this image at the top right is one that I've taken from San Diego to just kind of think about economic development broadly <clears throat> and how these tools are kind of all in place and place-based. I've showed just kind of like different layers of where you see these tools in place. So Ote Mesa was one of the first enhanced infrastructure financing districts. You can see it there on the bottom corner, but it is not uh, located within the opportunity zones, obviously from what you can see here, but there's many communities who are putting EIFDs with opportunity zones. But you can see kind of projects here that are on the map that have a lot of similarity with each other. And I think that similarity is where you can kind of see where the opportunity zones are, right? It's the areas that have received disinvestment. And it's when you kind of picture it all in your mind, it really, you see all these things kind of come together in the same places. And so I'm just to show some of these the local tools that are happening in San Diego in this example, you have a business improvement district, which I know many local governments and businesses are familiar with. Uh, you have the EIFD, which is at the end of the day, a local tool. You have the inc these incubators and accelerators. You have a state funding for affordable housing. You have state funding for trade corridor enhancement program for that is with the Port of San Diego, uh, which is by the California Transportation Commission. And then you have the inner city rail program, which is a California climate investment program to fund and transit infrastructure. And then of course you have these forms, you have the opportunity zones to attract the private capital. You have the San Diego promise zone and as shared earlier by Zio, all the opportunity zones in San Diego, the San Diego Promise Zone, all of their census tracts are opportunity zones. And you can see that alignment here as I've drawn around the map of the OZs. Um, and then of course, as Maria just said, you have the foreign trade zone overlapping it all and including this area. So a lot of just nexus of economic development when you're thinking about it from a larger perspective of zooming out and thinking about all the tools that are in place. The thing about EIFD and CREA is they can support all these things. All these things that I'm showing up here to you they can play a part and play a role. And that's what is neat about them as a separate authority or separate body in economic development and why many communities in the pandemic are looking to create them is because they're thinking about how do I forge forward this new path of economic development with a body that is able to act and maybe spur a lot of the attention around thinking about specified areas in addition to these existing programs. So uh, as mentioned earlier, Really, I just wanted to highlight uh, one uh, activity in that is available to those who are pursuing tax increment financing and opportunity zones. This is called regional early action planning. This is specifically tailored towards housing, but there's a due date uh, in January. There's tens of millions of dollars available through this to specified applicants uh, being um, those who are consortiums listed under HGD in the funding, this funding source particularly, and then the larger councils of government. So think of like the larger regional players like your SCAGs and so on and so forth. And this is for incre increasing housing. If you look at this funding opportunity and you go to eligible activities, best practices, uh, you'll see that opportunity zones, creation of tax increment financing districts, uh, are included as eligible activities in this funding. So um, we're encouraging everybody to go if you're at the local government le level because this has been extended to January for the submission of this and consider looking at both this funding opportunity and potentially working with 
your regional council of governments and potentially using some of the funding to work on maybe tax increment financing or on opportunity zones. There has to be an element of support for housing. So that is the part of the, the planning. There has to be a nexus to housing within this, this funding stream. But the Korea, naturally in your tax increment financing district, you will likely have housing. Ote Mesa is a very unique example that I showed below, but there's most districts have housing some portion in them. Um, if the CREA, you already are having a district, the CREA is literally a district that says in law that you are able to then access HCD funding through this specific type of tool. So they have already said, they looked at the CREA and said, look, this tool is exactly, I mean, this is kind of touches on affordable housing. So REAP is great for designing this type of thing. Um, and so this concludes my portion of talk about tax increment financing. So that is uh, to say that just to round out this um, piece is that the, the nature of that we're in that we often hear with these tools at, a, at an economic development level is that look this working with this tool requires me to talk to uh, different departments and agencies around government in my local government to be able to execute or to be able to move the path forward. But just like as you saw many of us presenting at the state level here in this presentation here together that we all did, we just did it via Zoom. It's just in this time broadly, I think it was shared earlier that our ability to meet together to talk about a shared goal or trying to achieve a certain type of resource together is it's been made a lot easier because of things like Zoom and Microsoft Teams. So um, if you are a local government and you're pursuing these tools, you know, may now may be an opportune time because of that nature of collaboration that exists. Considering one of them can be used for supporting businesses and trying to bring up small businesses in like a main street or a downtown as you're coming out of COVID, there's that too as well. Um, I would just really encourage folks to look into the tools and the statute and think if they're applicable to them. Uh, the last thing I'd say is just for businesses, if you are businesses, you can also look to this tool to be able to see if one is in your area, to be able to see how you can partner in utilizing some of the funding for your project, or you can be an advocate to your community and potentially exploring one. So with that, I'll stop. And then I'm going to ask everybody else who is just on the panel to turn on their camera. Uh, so we can, we can go ahead and open it up for questions and I will stop sharing. Okay, so if there are anyone in the audience, so we have both tax credits, employment training panel, foreign trade zones and the grants portal. We have a lot of different things that align with opportunity zones and promise zones, but a lot of tools here and resources to support economic development widely if anyone has any questions, you can you can go ahead and submit them in the chat and we can go ahead and ask the panel here. If not, I do have a few questions for panelists too. Um, so I see a question on do REAP grant funds if allocated to explore EIFD CREA require the ultimate portion formation of an EIFD CREA? No, the, the language that it says, it does not. Uh, it says that the funding is used to provide education and capacity building for supporting the build out of future housing. So um, it doesn't have to result. It's not like a, the way that the nature of the NOFA is written is that it's not that you have to complete a specific type of like planning document in order to, uh, if you have the money in place. Um, and then if we, if there's any other questions from the audience on any of the incentives for our panelists here. That seeing, I think it's, we're at the end of the day. I do have a few questions. So one thing that I wanted to ask each and every one of you is, you know, people, a lot of local governments and businesses often speak about the benefit of pairing resources together. What resources have you seen your program be paired with often or, or resource pair, paired with often, both from maybe a business or from a local government perspective? What other resource out there to pair with both what you've shared that you've seen? And maybe I'll start with you, Robert. Um, we, I've, I've seen a, a lot of partnerships with the Local Workforce uh, Development Board. 
uh, where they are facilitating recruitment and retention uh, efforts uh, with like layoff aversion funding. Um, and they bring in or partner with, uh, you know, with regional expertise or industry specific expertise. And between the three programs really offer um, a comprehensive sort of package for both job creation, as well as re retention efforts in specific industry sectors. Yeah, so I, I guess I'll maybe answer that question on a couple of different fronts. Um, you know, as it relates to specific types of acti activities that companies are trying to do here in California, like hiring, um, you know, that opens the door to a specific set of different incentive and resources programs like Robert's program, the employment training panel, um, but also the California competes tax credit program to, um, you know, get corporate income tax credits to hire workers, um, new hires, um, and then the new employment credit as well that I went over, um, you know, for hiring specific types of workers. Um, a lot of those programs can also be applied for from an, an investment angle as well. Um, you know, if you plan to make um, a, a different set of investments here in the, in the state of California for different opportunities of growth um, and expansion. Um, but one thing I'll kind of just stress is, uh, you know, when you think about applying for these different incentive programs, you also want to um, factor into the mix the timing. Um, timing plays a, a, a large role in when is the right time to apply for these different incentive programs. Oftentimes, um, before you make a decision to locate in California, you want to apply for some of these incentive programs because you would be seen as more competitive as you are trying to make that but for consideration um, where you may not be able to locate in California without receiving a set of these incentive offerings. And so that would include the California Competes Corporate Income Tax Credit Program. It also could include um, programs that are administered locally or have a, a local applicability like uh, utility discount rates. Um, that would you would be able to get from individual utility districts, but also from our um, utility providers with PG&E, SoCal Edison, and San Diego Gas and Electric. Um, so I think it kind of depends on the situation and circumstances for companies and what can be packaged together. But um, you know, again, I just want to stress: best thing to do is really get in touch with one of our specialists in our office, so we can really. Um, you know, have that one-on-one -on -one discussion with you, understand what your operations and activities are going to be here in California so we can, um, you know, tailor um, the incentive package and, and make sure that you get connected to the right programs for you at the right time. Shivani, I want to see maybe for the grants portal. Yeah, um, I think uh, for the grants portal is kind of new. So uh, unfortunately, I mean, I can only speak to what we've learned in our discovery, um, what other tools that are similar to ours um, that's out there um, that could potentially help the users who are looking for uh, for funding in the state is, you know, one is obviously the, the federal grants.gov um, that we uh, looked at a lot when we were building ours. Um, we also looked at, um, you know, uh, Air Resources Board has a, a tool called Funding Wizard um, that also tracks a lot of the fundings um, in the state um, that are related to natural resources. So um, I would say, you know, for uh, those who are interested in, in funding, um, that find a funding that might be eligible for their organization on our portal um, to really contact the department um, and, and or contact us to try to direct you to um, the right person um, so that you can ask more questions and see if it is really fits your um, fits your organization to apply um, before you're ready to apply for that. Great, thank you, Maria. Yeah, so I think that foreign trade zones really kind of lend themselves naturally to uh, manufacturers and to exporters. So I would say uh, any of the incentives that Poonam uh, raised that are uh, particularly for manufacturers, I would keep those in mind if you're looking at locating in an FTZ. And on the export side, if, um, you know, if you're exporting from an FTZ uh, and you're a small business, I would have a look at the STEP program. Great, thank you all for that one. I think that that one's very timely. I just hear like local governments talking all the time about what can I pair with this or what is a good case example? And I think Poonam, I think you shared about the economic development rate with Cal Competes, how we always pair folks with those two tools because there's a lot of the similar language. And I think that kind of transitioned to a question that I received and it's 
it's uh, maybe also, it's kind of partially for Shivani too. Um, a user says kind of, do you have any economic development recommendations for ju jurisdictions that may not meet most state grant qualifications, maybe those that are identified under the metrics that other agencies have? So there's a question, sorry, Trace, can you repeat the question? Is the question about what other programs can be utilized that they're not able to qualify for? for? I think I think the question is more around, you know, and Shivani and what you're seeing and coming in from state grants is those communities who maybe think, you know, maybe I don't have a lot of disadvantaged community related parcel tracks to be able to pursue the state grant funding. Are there opportunities out there that you see exist for those communities in economic development in or maybe, you know, despite not having a Cal, you know, a lot of Cal and bio screen tracks. You're mute. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so yes, I think uh, uh, looking at uh, grant opportunities, I think state agencies are doing, um, you know, a lot, um, a lot of internal uh, process improvement in, in that way. Uh, we have asked them to tag specific categories and disadvantaged communities is one, um, one, of the, uh, one of the categories that they will be able to tag their grant opportunities if it is um, fall under someone who is in that community um, if, it's, if it's available for them, right? Um, there is geographic limitations that are also written out in the uh, details of the grant opportunities. The idea of um, all of those opportunities is to provide you with a glimpse um, where you could spend 15, 20 minutes reading um, a very standardized information about that grant opportunity to see if you're even eligible for it before you move into the RFP that might be a lot lengthier, right? Like 30 pages long. Um, and some organizations may not have the resources to be able to, you know, go through that to figure out if they're going to apply. So, um, so I think uh, us providing those fields up front as a way to um, highlight some of those areas or organizations and communities that might be eligible for those grant opportunities is one way, um, you know, we, when we talked to folks um, was, was easy, easily visual for them to uh, determine if it's, they can be eligible for that. Um, I hope that answers your question. That's good. And I, I just wanted to add, you know, <clears throat> the tool that I shared at the end in economic development, the EIFD, it's it's not related to a grant. You can pick any census tract. So I think that um, there's a lot of tools out there for economic development that you can use that are not maybe adhered to a specific requirement on a local level. Uh, but I really encourage folks to really explore Shivani's portal because the different types of applications and keywords you can use to plug and play to see what state grants are available out there. I mean, it's turned up a lot for me personally in being able to see uh, what is available at the state. So, uh, and then I did receive another question, which is, as we look ahead to a post-pandemic um, California, do, pan do any of the panelists envisions any changes to your programs or incentives uh, in the future? And maybe we'll start with Robert. Um, you know, we, we've certainly uh, responded well, I think, uh, in terms of uh, the needs of reopening the economy and where to direct our funding, uh, primarily towards the job creation projects, uh, as well as the uh, COVID pilot and the larger response plan projects. So the response plan itself really had an, an impact in uh, adding flexibilities that the employers, our current contractors needed, but also a establishing a prioritization for those uh, industry sectors that are going to be critical to uh, reopening the economy. Uh, you know, we still support at any level uh, we can uh, career pathway and opportunities for manufacturers uh, and advanced uh, technology companies to be able to innovate and, and to use our funds to uh, to hire, but also to adapt to market conditions. Um, the respond program that we have, uh, I think as well, you know, we're, we're training basically people that will be working to clear fire, to, to harvest for, uh, fuel, uh, forest fuels, uh, and to make pro manufacture products from that. Uh, we've seen several infrastructure related projects for communications in the communities that have been impacted by catastrophic levels of fire. Um, and so we hope to make sure that we're relevant for, for those businesses that are impacted by some of the changing circumstances in, in, in California. So 
you know, emphasizing there, uh, and, and certainly uh, with an eye towards uh, clean technology as well. Uh, you know, looking forward, and thankfully with a uh, you know a changing administration, uh, one that will uh, sort of amplify our efforts in California uh, to to innovate and uh, be on the leading edge. Anyone else? I think Poonam, did you want to think any thoughts about the different tax credit programs? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, one of the last program that I did hit on was definitely uh, a direct, um, you know, reason to have a new tax credit for small businesses in particular to help support with the COVID-19 impacts that they've endured and just understanding that a lot of small businesses who maybe didn't qualify for um, the SBA loans that were administered um, earlier um, and maybe have been struggling a little bit more and trying to obtain other financing opportunities. Uh, you know, I think that's really why that program was put in place in addition to some others um, like the California Rebuilding Fund um, that was announced on uh, November 20th to help provide um, another, uh, you know, clout of funding to really address small business needs at this point in time. So I think it's going to be an ongoing um, evaluation process as, you know, we roll out into the new year and really start to address um, the impacts that we're still seeing and, and, and new, um, you know, uh, recovery efforts that we're trying to tackle with new situations. So I think it's, it's going to be an evolving process as to how these incentive programs roll out. Uh, I know we've already been getting a lot of questions about how the new employment credit is, is looked at now, especially if it's related to workers um, who, uh, you know, are, are working from home and how to qualify those workers if you're hiring them. Um, and so, uh, and to still receive that uh, hiring tax credit from that standpoint. So I, I think it's, there's still more to see in the coming year, um, but there have already been some concerted efforts like the new um, business hiring tax credit that was just uh, approved. And, and again, just stressing out there for all those that are interested in that program to start applying for your tentative credit reservation with the Department of Tax and Fee Administration. Um, it will be open until January 15th. Great, and I know, I know that we're kind of coming up here near the end, so because I do have one more question for everyone else and all the panelists here. Uh, so, you know, akin to the end of the last panel, um, you know, we're kind of here ending this discussion today, going forward, thinking about what that is the next thing. What are some maybe positive things that you're looking forward into the new year related to your department, your field in economic development that you're working with, your program, your resource uh, in the coming months and in the coming year. And maybe I'll start with Maria. Putting me on the spot. Um, <laughs> thanks for the question. I think it's a really interesting one. Um, you know, it, it's kind of a, the, Working remotely has created the opportunity on the international side to really uh, have a lot more engagement, um, given that we're not really thinking about travel. We have so many more virtual events. So I'd say that that's one really um, interesting way we've been able to, to build and enhance our, our global partnerships. On the foreign trade zone side, that's a federally administered program, uh, and it recently underwent a pretty uh, drastic makeover, moving from the traditional site framework, which was quite strict in terms of where businesses had to be located relative to the, the jurisdiction of the grantee, into an alternative site framework, which creates a lot more flexibility in uh, where the actual businesses taking advantage of the FTZ can, can be based. So I think it's exciting to see, um, you know, how communities and businesses are continuing to take advantage of this. And, uh, you know, we're really working to spread the word on FTZs. Um, so that's what I'd say. Shivani? Thank you, Trey. Um, yeah, so I think uh, for Grants Portal, uh, we are continuing to collect feedback from our stakeholders, so our grant seekers. Um, again, if you have any feedback after you've uh, played around with the tool, uh, we're totally open to that. I think uh, right now we have a few features that we are looking to enhance on the portal um, in coming months um, and continue working on making sure we improve our um, stakeholders experience and, and how we can add other 
uh, functionalities that would make um, our grant seekers lives easier to um, find those grant opportunities and also um, continue to you know apply for uh, what's they're eligible for so yeah we're, we're uh, in the in the virtual world we're continuing to connect with our grant seekers our non nonprofit world local government businesses anyone who is interested in providing us um, what are some needs and challenges um, around the grant making is um, and we're, we're all open ears um, and hoping that we can build upon this tool uh, to bring more opportunities um, in, in one central place. Thank you. Poonam? Yeah, I think from uh, the CalBiz side of things within the GoBiz team, I, I think what we're most excited about in the new year, new year is onboarding regional specialists, uh, which I've been working very hard right now to uh, kind of do all the recruiting and, and going through the interview process to onboard uh, four additional regional specialists that we're going to have in territory to complement the efforts of the governor's uh, regions to rise initiative. So we plan Plan to have uh, support within the Central Coast, Central Valley, Inland Empire, and Northern California areas, which is really going to help us strengthen our um, partners, partner relationships that we have in territory, but also help support them in their regional capacities to help with economic development in those areas. And so that, I think, complements well to this event, um, the Opportunity Zone um, you know, efforts that are going up and down the state. And I think, um, you know, we're also planning on having those regional specialists be tied into those discussions at the local level um, to see how our office can uh, be more supportive in that role. Thank you, Robert. Well, um, given the program demand and uh, and sort of the flex that the program is going to have to have to serve the wide ranging partnerships that we actually uh, maintain, um, I'm really excited to see more involvement from our panel, uh, primarily around the idea of, uh, of a deeper level of consideration of the projects that we fund. Uh, and, and while it may come across as being a little bit more um, uh, of, of an effort to spread funds around, I think what will actually happen is that the information about the types of programs and employers that we get to work with in the range of industry sectors that we have, where the employers are really providing a compelling look at, at what's needed to be on the front uh, you know, of, of an industry sector, of a technology, uh, of, of new programs and new products, uh, new markets. Um, you know, I'm really see, excited to see that the, the stories that will be told uh, about the types of projects that we're fortunate enough to fund. Great. Thank you for that answer, everyone. And thank you for being and hanging out with us for the last of this panel and the last of this day. So for those who are in attendance in the audience, um, we just want to thank you for your questions for this panel and also sticking with us for the end. All the present presenters uh, pan are presentations will be posted online. Uh, so we will have that accessible to you and you'll receive an email also individually uh, noting where the presentations will be available. So I know that there was a question too as well. I know that we're at the end of the day and we're near five o'clock. So I wanted to thank all the panelists that we have on here. Uh, thank you everyone. And for being along with us for the whole day. Uh, the last thing is if there's any questions that we did not answer via Q and A, we will be posting in a piece online. And you can always ask questions to us through the contact us form. And we have the direct contact information we will not only be sharing of the panelists here and throughout the event, but we can always be able to connect you with the individual programs, agencies, or if you're looking to do a project, if you're a business that needs assistance, if you're a community, to be able to find what you need to bring your project to success in economic development. So long day. That being said, thank you for joining us. Uh, the last thing I also say is please fill out our survey. Please fill out the Opportunity Zone survey. You should receive it in a link following the event. So thank you, everyone.